我们欢迎一诺，来，嗯，来，那个。见的真人了啊，那个很亲切。那一诺很忙，所以他的团队今天很多就是为了见到他，专门也亲自来参加这个会啊。所以呢，我是冰原，我是负责整个大中华区的那个 communication 的。我今天也很激动，因为我这是这采访是我的老本行，干了一辈子了。那么到 Google 没人给我机会，今天给我第一把这么一个重要的是这个机会第一次留给了我，所以我觉得很很兴奋。那么就是我们今天是大概的这个呃这个会议的日程是这么安排的啊，这个第一项是我们有一个 ice breaker， 这是 Google 的一个传统嘛。第二呢就是音乐会有做一个演讲，那么之后呢就会把最后的时间留给大家做做做互动和提问。这个给一诺一个一个首先 something exciting， 这对这在谷歌是一个 big size 的一个 meeting。<笑>那么因为现在是现临近圣诞节嘛，所以说很多人开始休假，所以我们。基本上 save the best for last， 所以，所以我觉得，呃、我那个我这虽然一把年纪了呢，还是还是那个先先是 ice breaker 吧，呃，一诺呢之前接受过很多采访，他也接受过这样的问题，所以我今天呢这个十个问题十问十答呢，有五个你回答过，就看你是不是跟以前回答的不一样了，呃，还有五个就是现编的啊，呃，首先呢就是大家认识一诺吧。我先我先宣读一下吧，一诺的简单的情况，呃，李一诺现任比尔盖和美琳达盖茨基金会中国负责人，呃，是前麦肯锡全球董事合伙人，他是二零一六年世界经济论坛全球青年领袖、苏世民学者项目的学术委员会成员，罗德奖学金中国区评委，然后呢，他本科毕业于清华大学。后获得加州大学洛杉矶分校 UCLA 分分子生物学博士，和先生盛华章共同创办的微信公众号“奴隶社会”，有这个这先不不念了，因为这个是我的问题。<笑>第一，一诺问一下一诺，从小最想做什么？哎，你拿一话筒。太不专业了。对，忘了这茬了都。让我非常失望。哦、<笑>下一个问题。啊。好，那第二个问题，从小最想做什么？<笑>我其实小时候特别想开个商店。啊，这基本跟二零一七年回答差不多，挣钱。对。啊、嗯，第二个呢，呃，你最崇拜的人？嗯、呃，我姥爷吧。嗯。这回问题没回答没变，不忘初心。<笑>第三个，小时候的梦想实现了吗？嗯、呃，算实现了吧。上次说的是没有。嗯<笑>嗯拆台。第四个是大学期间最喜欢读的一本书。哎呀，我那时候特别红，我那时候读的一本书叫做《树坚不怕风吹动》。是你们清华大学党委书记写的。<笑>对，这这次记住了，记住了。呃，第五个这是必答题啊，这这之前回答过。最近读的一本书。最近读的一本书叫《要领》，叫《Leading Matters》。哦、oh, ，是那个 Stanford 校长写的，嗯、因为我我我被委托给他写一个推荐语，所以我必须得读一下那本书。啊，这这这回不是朗读日记了，上次是、oh, 对,对,对。好，这五个题目，先生一诺以前回答过，就是这个不，他不会很兴奋。第这六到十是我们现编的问题。<笑>第一个是带孩子累吗？累。有多累啊？肯比你累。嗯，好。<笑>第二个是第八个问题，呃，第七个问题，回国三年多习惯了吗？嗯，没有完全。啊、哦，没问题。OK， 下一个问题，觉得自己有缺点吗？没有。<笑>行。倒数第二，倒数第二个问题，倒数第二个问题就是刚才你其实那个你介绍了已经有，但是得问一下，奴隶社会现在有多少粉丝？啊、哦，最近一次看好像一百一十三万吧，啊。哦，这算多吗？不多。啊、哦，不算多。OK。最后一个问题，大家肯定特别兴奋，用过谷歌产品吗？啊，是天天为了用谷歌还得翻墙。现在用吗？用、啊。什么？比如？比如。比如 Gmail。Gmail。OK。YouTube 上吗？上上。OK。还 YouTube Kids。哦、oh, ，OK、嗯。好。大家还满意吧？<笑>我我我我觉得我觉得接下来我们就把这个宝贵的时间留给一诺，他有一个非常精彩的一个。Keynote， 然后之后呢，我们会进入提问环节，好吧？好，<笑>谢谢。好，大家好，不告诉我是用英文讲，那是用中文讲还是英文讲呀？呃，你英文吧，要用英文讲也可以。这个国际影响力，国际影响力，嗯、好不好？<笑><笑>
<laughs> All right. Okay. So first of all, really, thank you for the opportunity, and then thank you for turning up at 3 p.m. instead of working. I hope your uh, direct manager is okay with you joining this. Um, so I think for the topic I want to share is basically on the slides, uh, social innovation for future education. So yes, you know, as you've heard, I have many roles, and today I'm sharing the capacity as co-founder of uh, E2 Education, not in others. Um, but you know, when we have q and I'm happy to address more questions. So I guess I want to start a bit of, uh, of the inspiration. So one thing, um, as you've heard, I, you know, as you, I know I was a professional, I'm still, uh, I am a professional. Um, and one of my biggest uh, realization when I um, started, um, you know, early part of my McKinsey is realizing this huge disconnect between uh, what school produces versus what society needs. Um, a lot of the training or, or, or pickup were actually done um, when you know when we graduate and you know get to the real world. So I think that was you know one realization I've had you know when I was at McKinsey. Um, I want to share this as as all this sort of realizations contributed to why I started doing what I do. So that's the first uh, um, uh, observation. I know interestingly there was a survey down saying that they were asking um, uh, employers like how happy are you with your fresh graduate recruits? Um, and basically, you know, maybe the satisfaction rate is about 11%, right? So people are not very happy, people want more. But if you ask for the um, universities in this case, like, you know, how confident are you that, you know, what you educated are, you know, quali qualify for, uh, are ready for the real society? And then like 90% said, yes, definitely <laughs> we're ready. So there's, you'll see this big disconnect. I think that's, that's number one, especially coming from a professional world. Um, I think number two is this um, growing anxiety. So I, I guess when, that's why when I was asked, am I adjusting back to sort of China? I think partially not, because this increasing level of anxiety I feel around myself by almost everybody, especially parents. Um, so then that make you ask why, right? So why there's so much anxiety, and then what's the solution for it? So I think that's the sort of second reason. There's another reason which I found this result very shocking. So this is a survey done, I think in 2016, basically asking uh, out of the teachers, how many of you want your children to be teachers? Um, basically, you know, only about 2% said absolutely yes. So basically, it's not a very satisfying or re re rewarding profession. Um, and if you think about this, it's pretty scary, right? So like, um, you know, because education is about what? Education is about our future, right? So if nobody wanted to invest or get passionate about, you know, educating for our future, then this is pretty worrisome. So I think that's the, um, you know, the third reason. And the other, the other reason is this, you know, this is a map from a few years ago. I think I say this increasingly connected world. Um, for now, so this map basically is showing for each country, which country is their number one trading partner, okay? Um, so you will say, you know, for US is China, for China, uh, no, so for US is actually Canada, but for, um, for China is US, and then you see China everywhere. So, you know, in the way, if you look at trade or economic activities, we're actually very much uh, connected. But on the other hand, if you look, think about education, especially primary education, we're very much isolated. Um, you know, sometimes now we look at this whole China-US conflict. Frankly, I think partially, you know, at least from the US side, I think this is because in the, you know, a lack of understanding of China for decades of education, which becomes a result today, right? So decision makers, policy makers today, when they were in school, they probably did not get exposed to a, a more global view. I think similarly to us, although in a way much better are in our understanding of, of, of America because there's movies and everything, but do we really understand what people are like, you know, how society are functioning beyond what you see in, in, uh, in movies? So I think that's the other thing, like, you know, the, the world is becoming more connected, but education isn't. So I think that's another um, reflection. So, and then there's another one, which is, I say, this in widening in you know, in education inequity, which um, those are all schools in China, actually, right? So you see international schools, pretty typical. You also see this really bad schools. And in a way, I think that gap, um, isn't uh, narrowing, right? So, you know, you, you still, especially in my work, I, I go to see some of them. And, and you, you ask the question why, why there are still schools like that? And on the other hand, the, the good schools are getting better and better, uh, you know, more money, more uh, equipment, more investments. 
So I think those are all kind of a collection of uh, reflections, observations I've had, not as an educator, just as you know, somebody who's living in a society, probably lived in different worlds, um, and and you know, sort of exposed to different aspects of, of real life. Um, so basically, the question you ask is, um, you know, why is this right? So I think I said in the way. Um, you feel like education is, a, I call it, a, a bit of getting into a, a place of a vicious cycle. Uh, why do we say that? Because um, in a way, um, it probably starts with the teacher part. So if you cannot attract good talent into education, um, then you, you basically end up with not so good talent, right? So, and we are in companies, where we all understand how important it is for talent recruiting, talent development. And if you end up people who are not motivated, not qualified, then you ended up be, you know, having, having the school to be a very much highly controlled environment, right? Because you're, you're, you cannot sort of empower <laughs> or whatever things we are saying typically in, in professional world. So you become a highly controlled environment, which is very true in many of our schools. Um, and if you do that, then then basically your the entire um, you know the, the the system is not geared towards innovation, right? So not geared towards enabling innovation. It's geared towards basically risk management, right? So really, how do you control risks? And then if that's the case, then the system will you know will attract even fewer people or fewer good people to enter the space, right? So if you are somebody who's you know, have an open mind, want to make a difference, you wouldn't pick a system like that. So in a way, that's, you know, when you reflect, it really becomes the system where, you know, we have high control, I call it, you know, low trust and high anxiety. Um, so in a way, this, the cycle becomes, you know, the way it is. Um, and sometimes you think about education, although we pick an idea of, you know, doing starting with a school, but education really isn't, you know, a problem that can be solved by education itself. Uh, education is a reflection of all the social problems behind it and beneath it, right? So then, that's why when you think about the sort of you know, wanting to first first of all diagnose what the problem is, and also when um, trying to figure out a solution, you have to take a systematic view as well. So if you think about the system, and and then when you will you will see the result is that schools are becoming very isolated. Like so, they you know because all the players in the system somehow becomes the enemy, right? So parents because the anxiety and expectation becomes sort of an enemy for the school, and teachers because it's unsatisfying profession becomes the enemy of the school, um, and then then you know they're you know all sort of professional world you know because they they, they they don't get the right talent they need to become an enemy of the school. So I guess school becomes sort of this isolation, and then. Um, and, and because of that anxiety, actually, is pushing school to be more and more isolated to be safe, right? So, like you know, you will see all the happenings now. Um, you know, one of the things we observe, I wrote about in my articles, is that you know, um, some of our schools prohibit prohibit kids to run. Uh, you know, in uh, um, between classes, um, which you know, I guess, what kind of school would do that? It, it's against whatever development theory. You don't need even a development theory to understand that's wrong. Uh, but, the, but the problem is that if you run, if you run into somebody, um, and if you hurt the other child or whatever, and then the parents would be so nervous, they will sue the school, <laughs> and then the school will say, okay, there's so much you know cost to it, and then so then they say, okay, instead of you know paying your money or getting in the lawsuit, I would say I did not allow them to run. So if they run, this is your personal liability, right? So that become a quote unquote solution. It's not a solution, but that's but you see that's so like you know basically we're pushing almost the system to be more risk averse um, and more controlling and more enclosed. Um, so I think that's why, you know, when you have the system, when you have a problem like that, and that becomes the reality. And that, of course, that will increase the level of anxiety, increase the level of um, you know, the satisfaction, uh, a professional satisfaction, everything. So then basically, well, you know, the question you would ask, look, and then, but we cannot change a massive system. Like, you know, yes, we all identify with the issues we all agree with, you know, the diagnostic. But who are we, right? So we're not minister of health. I'm a minister of education. And frankly, even if you were, you are not going to change much. Um, and you know, you know, we don't have a lot of money either. You know, it's not we can recreate a world. So I guess that's the problem I was thinking um, a few years ago. Of course, you know, also of course I have own kids, and that becomes a more real problem for me. Uh, basically, you know, in a long story, what we pick the path. I think the way, again, this is how you think about creating system change. So when you're facing a massive uh, system, um, and then it's very complex, 
how do you make a change in the system? So you, you don't make a change by changing the system itself right away because you're just, you know, you're so o overpowered, um, uh, you know, by the system itself. I guess the way you do it is that you, you create a small functioning system first, right? So can you, you know, if I cannot get an entire school of a thousand kids, can I start with 30 kids and 30 families, right, who believe this is the right way they want to function? They don't want to sue the school if somebody's hurt, right? So like, you know, can you do that? And then that is feasible, actually. So then, so that's exactly how we started. Um, we started when I wrote my first article in April 2016. Um, we said we got three classrooms. That's when I first moved back to China. Um, and we have about 30, 31 kids and five teachers. And that's really how we started. But then you would ask, okay, the first one you would ask, okay, is it, is it possible? And second you ask, is it possible in China, <laughs> right? So we all know China is different. And also is it possible, you know, you know to, you know, China, and the world, and you know, can you make some connection there? You know, again, echoing what you know I've referred to, probably especially for companies like Google, because you operate, you know, in a way as a global company as well. You know, is there a potential tie? I think those are the sets of questions we've been asking ourselves as well. So we started with the first one, sort of, is it possible? And I guess I, I gave you a bit of our at least our approach in creating something new first. Um, and then basically the, the idea we had is really, instead of thinking of school as a school or as a, because usually when we understand education, we think about oh, this is a curriculum, this is teachers, this is their exit plan, you know, which school they're going to. I think those are right, but those are a very small, you know, sets of what the reality of the school. So in, a school at the end of the day is a community, right? So, so I say, that's why we said those three sort of constraints circles, I said we put, you know, the, the, the very centric circle is our children. So you put you know, children in the center of your classroom. So they do children-centered education. And then the second layer is our teachers. So how can you support teachers as professionals, right? So, as, so I have this idea, as I call it, teachers as leaders. Because if somebody's, you know, stand in front of 40 kids and 40 kids follow him or her, and he, by definition, is a leader, right? So if you think about that, you know, how do you support them as a professional, as a leader? I think that's the other interesting thing, because we think about think of, think of leadership as a very corporate world uh, word, right? So you're, you go to an MBA and you do that, but actually leadership is needed everywhere, especially um, in school. But it's but, but because it doesn't have that that um, highlight, and then you know you don't often you know talk about that way. And then also I think the last one is the, you know putting you know school at the center of the community, so like and parents as a community around it. So the the essence of it is you know is basically this word called relations. So basically you know if you think about it, it's really changing the relationship between different members in the community. The reason our community our you know, education sometimes feel very painful is because all the relationships are wrong, right? So the relationships, you know, teachers can be very hierarchical, um, teachers and parents can be very much, you know, um, you know, on the opposite side. Um, and, you know, and between parents, sometimes it is competitive, right? And then, so that's why all this relationship added together is not a nurturing uh, relationship. So I guess in essence, that's, if that's one word, that's it. So it's not, you know, the, of course you also have curriculum, you have design, you have, you know, schedule, you have all that, but I think that's all technical level and you will get that done. But you have to under, if I understand deep down, it's really around rebuilding or reconnecting uh, in the different sets of relationship. Um, and after that is also the, um, sorry, um, so, you know, so I have a pretty, this very simple idea. I was like, you know, what, what should a good education be? I think everybody can have this answer. You don't need to have a PhD in education to do that, right? So you want kids to be happy, you want teachers to be happy, and you want parents to be happy, right? At the end of the day is that everybody, that's, that's the type of center, you know, three circles we talked about, right? Um, and then that's, but then how do you do that? Um, so the whole journey we started, I call it, we kind of start this small room when I talk about the small sample. This is a, yeah, this is eight square meters. That's the first year uh, room we have. Um, and I share this book I've read um, called Surrender Experiment. In a way, the whole idea is that um, oftentimes when we do things, especially in the professional world, you think, okay, I need to control um, how things go. If I lose control, then I'm going to fail. Um, but when you do something like this or education, you you'd somehow have to you know, sort of surrender yourself to life itself um, and gave you a lot of direction. So if I start with that room to, to today, now we have about 400 kids. Um, that's, you know, really that's kind of probably the nature of the journey. Um, and but from that room, now we have, as I said, you know, from this three classrooms to about 
uh, to we have three campus, well, one in Beijing, one in Guangzhou, and then uh, this is the second year for a school in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and then also we have this online community uh, of parents and, and all that. Um, so it, it become a quite you know interesting expansion. Again, it's not a, a typical sort of a company like expansion, right, where you roll out thousands of customers. But we are indeed trying to implement that um, in different set of settings. Um, and then it was actually interesting. One of the connection of that, you probably recognize the guy in the middle between me and my husband is uh, Salman Khan, who started Khan Academy. So that was in uh, December 2015 when I was still living in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, I have to say it was actually interesting. It was a conversation with him that Although we didn't do anything concrete with them, but that was sort of my inspiration. So he wrote this book called One World Schoolhouse. Uh, it's a pretty thin book. If you have a time to read it, it will be quite interesting. So he basically was challenging the entire education system, saying like, and I, you probably have heard it, right? So if you look at education today, how different it is from you know 200 years ago when industrial revolution is starting. Really, not much difference, right? So he was having all these ideas. So right now, if you look back, he, he's more like a visionary. So he's he also has own, his own school. We probably call Khan Lab School, um, but it, you know, there when you get operational. Frankly, when I f I remember when I first visited his school, I was kind of disappointed <laughs> because I read the book. I was like, oh, this is so massive. But you, when you see in reality, even such a massive figure like him, um, school itself is actually quite problematic. But that being said, I'm not saying like even E2 today, if you walk into it, I'm, I'm sure you'll find it's, you know, to a certain extent problematic as well. Um, but that was an interesting, at least I think that inspiration and the vision was really inspiring. Because I think that's, uh, that's how you start. You will stumble, you will fail. Um, but having that vision is actually quite important. The other one is, of course, my, this is my oldest when he was five, and he actually got enrolled in, um, that's when all school opened its first campus, that's his teacher. And I think that was sort of a trigger to that, um, to, um, you know, you know, seeing you know, at least different type of people and trying to do different things in, in Silicon Valley. Well, I, I was really there as a parent, I don't know very little about education around that time. But those are the early days, sort of started a bit of my journey. and then. Uh, SF2, this is, this is Andy, the same, <laughs> uh, my, my oldest, this is first year, second year, and third year, he's a fourth grader now in E2. So in a way, you know, he, he, now he's old enough, he always asks me, mom, you don't have my permission to use my pictures, so, so <laughs> please don't tell him I used it. Um, anyway, so, but anyway, I was interested sometimes, you know, putting this together. So this is every year when we take a picture of the kids, they have this little blackboard and drawing on that. What, what do they want to be when they grow up? Just like the first question I got. Yeah, so you know, that's, that's, so it changes, right? So it's okay. <laughs> anyway, so I think that was a bit of a personal um, journey to it, uh, seeing um, you know, kids growing. Um, and then when we do that, you know, again, education is not only about vision, right? So it's, it's actually a very complex uh, operational system. Uh, so if you're, we're used to running companies, you will know how complex it is. So everything started with, we call it the core competency. Basic core competency means like if you do a product, you know, what is the product profile? Like what do you want? What's the product going to be? This is, if you think about our children as, you know, that's a bad word for them, but you know, what, what do you, you know, sort of, we call it graduate profile. Like what do you want your kids to grow up to be when they graduate? So those are the five things we call out, right? So you have to, you know, basically have self-awareness, know yourself, um, and you have, um, you know, basically a, a ability to appreciate, you know, be beautiful things in life, you know, both in terms of, you know, even including your body, including the nature, including art, um, and also you can work together. Go to so you, you can learn to learn, which is very important. And we will okay, we call it make a difference. You know, I think the, the Chinese version we call it, you know, gan xiang gan zuo. So those are the few things. Five, and then you, because the reason it's a spiral is because it, you know, it evolves, right? So it's it's the same sets of five goals for kids, but its force is different from a five-year-old versus for a 12-year-old versus for 18-year-old. So that uh, evolves. And then if you double-click, then you have the second layer. So we have, um, you know, about at the end of the day, maybe about 80 or so, a uh, third la layer of indicators. And then we use that to drive uh, your curriculum design and your approach. That's really the, the ultimate, because at the end of the day, school is about um, supporting children to grow, and that's the goal we have in mind. So this is a bit of a methodology how we do that. And then the way we do it is, again, is the, the system is through this middle piece in terms of, uh, we talked about the, the teacher piece, the curriculum piece, and, uh, um, and um, you know, teacher professional development. And then you have the supporting systems, operations, uh, and, and all that. So 
can, in a way, although it's a small school, but the way we think about it is as 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 you know as think about it as a system. So the same thing, like how do you that's how you make a potential difference, and also then you have um, these ties we have, you know, between school and society and family, um, and how do you make it together? Because again, although we are only doing a school, but I guess those are the type of things we constantly talk about. Because only when you do that, you can have a congruent sort of system with society, rather than I have my own dreamland um, in isolation. Yeah, um, and then also when we talk about school at the center of community, that's the you know various communities that we have, both offline and online, um, and um, yeah. So, and then this is um, this is another angle we have because I uh, you know of course we are all you know you know most people here grew up in China, so I do want my kids to come back appreciate um, you know our culture, not just to learn the language because to learn the language can be very. Um, um, practical oriented, right? Pragmatic, but this is really a culture. So every year we decided to have our opening ceremony in the Forbidden City, and we go there. We don't have any privilege; we just buy tickets. <laughs> so, so it's not like we have any special admission. Um, so we have, to, we have to be very careful not to be, you know, you know, too uh, visible, so that you know the guards get so nervous. But it's very interesting. So every year it's such a huge uh, access. You, we have to teach our kids how to behave well as a, as a tourist, right? So when you have a small group of 20 kids together, how do you not annoy others? Um, and um, we have a very short da um, xue, um, uh, so this is you know, a, a Chinese classic. So it, they take about you know, 30 seconds to read it, and then, and then we, we dismiss. So it's actually quite interesting. So this, this, this uh, experience is also something we were thinking, how do you integrate with a bigger system, right? So in, you know, a school shouldn't just be about your campus, your buildings, the, you know, the, the entire world should be your campus. But what it takes is that you need to have design capability behind it, right? So how do you design experience so that when they, they go to Forbidden City, it's an educational experience. So, so, it's, so that's why I often say when you really do schools, you realize that the most critical things are always those that are invisible, right? So it's not about you have a building, have a swimming pool. You, know, you can be practically anywhere. You can make it educational if you have a good design thinking ability behind it. Um, and then the other thing, when we think about the connecting to the world, um, I don't know how many people recognize this little um, badge. This is the 17 goals of uh, uh, UN SDG goals. Um, I think we are the first um, school in China that, that actually make that as a guiding theme for our project-based learning. Uh, so I, oftentimes, I think people have this misperception of what is international education. I think in China, we usually, um, uh, you know, use you know we, we talk about international education, meaning we start learning English at three. Okay, so that's kind of it's a very simplistic view of international education. I think all education should be international. It doesn't matter which school you go to. The the key of international education is around caring and global issues and making connection of that to your own life. And that can be done in any setting. So this is something that's why we, we decided to do that. Um, and then this is, there's an example. Um, for example, this is a, a habitat improvement um, project. So basically kids go out even in your own schoolyard understanding you know, this is actually a habitat for certain animals, right? It could be for insects and for plants. Um, and then also there's a, um, this is one we did with trash. So basically how do people understand different type of garbage? And we actually started, um, you know, teaching kids to um, separate different type of garbages and for recycling way earlier. This is a um, company called, um, all, all, all uh, so they were one of the social uh, innovation companies that that um, run a business actually for recycling uh, for recycling. So our kids actually can make money. So each class make about I think forty RMB per month for <laughs> real money. So they can you know the more they do, the more they will get. So then they actually design their own garbage can. Um, you know you see the painting on it and everything. So I think those are the type of thing we're trying to do. So you know like you know it, it's not it, it, the, even the language itself, teaching language actually can be. Chinese, but I guess it's the essence. It's not on superficial stuff. Do you have a foreign teacher? Do you have English? And then do you, do you have? But it's really caring about global issues and making again a connection to your own life in a pretty genuine way. Um, and those are all examples of things we're trying to do. Uh, we, we call it for sustainable for uh, education for sustainable development. This is a um, village in Yunnan. Uh, so the the guy in the middle is a Professor Xiao Yunli. So he. 
uh, is a professor from Chinese Agricultural University and one of the leaders uh, in uh, poverty alleviation in China. So he started doing this effort in Yunnan, which is actually a real poor village. Their average um, household income per year is about 4,000 RMB. Uh, but they, they did some real remarkable work in helping them to revitalize their village. So every year we have about five to eight camps going to that village, actually, you know, kind of connecting with them. Instead of just doing a touristy thing, understanding what type of work are being done, what kind of effort are being put into uh, in trying to make this change. Um, and also, you know, on the other hand, we also have this sort of fancy part called assessment powered by technology, because all this concept may be fine, we call about AD ind indicators, but how do you collect the data, right? So how do you then analyze the data? How do you use the data to guide your assessment and guide feedback and then into your teaching? Um, so this is the uh, 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 app we created. Now we have, I think, maybe over, um, yeah, you know, 320 photos, videos, and and and, uh, and words on it. And those words actually can you can search by text. So you you really become a tool for teacher training for for everything as you can imagine. So the difficulty thing, difficult thing about education is that because people feel. You know, there are so many qualitative stuff, right? So, like, how do I get hold of it? So, I think this is our effort. You know, because even qualitative is also data. So, how do you actually use that data to to help um, guide your education process? Um, this one is about teachers. You know, I talk about teacher, um, the model of supporting teacher professionally. Those is really the competence model. I think all the HRs will understand. We use for companies. We use that for teachers as well. Um, and you know, integrating different resources globally. Those are different type of um, uh, uh, education innovators around the world. Um, we have a lot of teacher training and etc. With them. Um, and also online community for parents. So there, because again, because we have the social media presence, there are many people who follow us. But you know, I guess, but the school can only take a limited number of kids. So how do you make that um, philosophy or approach available for for many more? Yeah. Um, then also, you know, uh, uh, offline activities and all that. Um, I think one thing we're trying to do is on this. Um, Education equity part. Um, you know, this is one article we've helped develop for uh, a rural teacher in Jiangxi Province, and because of you know his her posting in our uh, account, uh, we got connected to um, you know to uh, C which is a again a social enterprise trying to do uh, critical thinking education. So they you know this is an innovative model we're trying. Basically, um, we help them sell their classes. Uh, one one class they sell, they will send a free class to a rural teacher. And through this effort, we're able to raise basically money for 2,000 rural teachers to get this online type of training. So, so that's why, because we're saying like if you're sitting in this you know, school in Beijing, how do you actually have a global uh, or, or, or impact to uh, rural education? And that's one effort in doing that. Um, and this is actually an article that we have posted. Um, yeah, and then this is, you know, if you're in Beijing uh, or if Google is looking for a um, philanthropy event, you sh I recommend this one. So, Tongxin um, Xueqiao, which is in, for the migrant children. Uh, we actually make it quite real. We, those are the middle picture you see is the E2 school students with their students. They actually did exchange both ways. So they went to their school and they actually came to our school. And then they designed a project to rebuild something together. So again, it's actually, sometimes when you look at those issues, you feel they're very massive, right? So, you know, but, but I guess the thing is that there are little intersections you could do uh, in bringing, again, the real world uh, to, um, to, to education itself. So I think the goal is that, you know, you'll remind this, you re probably remember this uh, vicious cycle. We're saying, you know, is there possible, let's turn that into a positive cycle, right? The positive cycle is you, you know, you actually talk about what you want to do and oftentimes you, you, you inspire good people or talented people to join you. Uh, once you join them, you, you can, they can join you, then you actually can have a more enabling um, environment for them to grow professionally. And then that will actually create a much more nurturing environment that will end up attracting more of such talent. Right? So I think that's why, you know, so I guess that's the vision. I don't think it's reality. I think it's, um, you know, basically it's, it's an empowering system instead of a controlling system. I, again, I think everybody who's worked will know in essence, that's how you get more potential out of people. But again, when you are in the massive system, sometimes you, you feel quite suffocating. It's hard for you to change alone. But when you have a small system, even our size, you at least, I guess, the, the real value of is not to have 10,000 E2 campuses getting you know 10,000 or whatever chain schools, but actually demonstrating that actually workable. And if it's workable, then there's a lot of value. Either people can copy it, or you could you know advocate for a broader um, um, change. 
Um, so I think when, you know, so I guess um, getting to the end of it, going to the official, the original sets of examples we have, is it, is it possible? Is it possible in China? Is it possible to China and the world? Um, I think I can. I can only say now, after uh, almost four years, it's. Uh, I can. I guess only say I'm kind of working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, but sometimes you do feel. I mean, the the reality is that it's actually quite difficult because it's. You know, it's not. You know, it's much easier if I use the current model to inspire more anxiety and sell your product, um, to pretend that I can solve it, um, and which is the business model for many education products, by the way. Um, um, and and then yeah, but so that sometimes I, I I use this quote actually recently in the Chinese lecture I did. I think you, you will end up feeling quite lonely, right? So sometimes you feel like, oh, am I doing the right thing, right? So there. Uh, you know all these other companies you 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 think is really bad are making shitload of money and you are really struggling on many fronts. Frankly, um, I think the yeah this is the uh, the the quote I, I really liked. I shared it quite a few times, but I think that's a really very well said. He says, uh, "Never doubt that a, a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world." Indeed. Is the only only thing that ever does. So uh, ever has. So you know. So those are, I guess, in the way sometimes inspirations you draw from, right? So like, um, I think you know, in a way, sometimes when you feel that this is difficult, it probably means you are doing the right thing. <laughs> it's just getting harder. So anyway, so I think that was um, uh, a bit of a journey we've been on. Thank you for your time. <laughs> working on it in Google term we call it working in progress. So I think that we can be positive. We can make progress. I think that I have a lot of people who are listening to this. I think that I have a lot of people who are listening to this. I think that I have a lot of people who are listening to this. Why do we have a lot of relevance? Why do we have a lot of people who are listening to this? I think that Google and Alphabet CEO 都曾经在 McKinsey 工作过，而伊诺曾经战斗的地方离我们 Mountain View 也不远，应该去过吧？对对对，对，所以当然今天他跟我们最接近的就是大家如果看这题目叫 Social Innovation for Future Education， 就是谷歌一直在，就是我们去 promote 我们自己就是 innovation， 就是我们包括特别是在中国，我们就讲的是我们是一个 innovative company， 所以我觉得其实伊诺这三年多吧，做了一件很了不起的事情。当然，我看过他之前的那些分享，也蛮难的，是不是也有说在那个操场上觉得自己无法控制自己的那种状态？所以，我先抛砖引玉吧。然后我知道这个，待会儿我们会让我们这个这个规则是，我会问一些问题，假装问一些问题。然后呢，我们会有 Dory， 我们有 Dory， 就是往线上会有些问题。然后我们在场的这个演播室的观众会问一些问题。对，所以这个我先抛砖吧。呃，我觉得就是，呃，就伊土现在这三年，我们就是中国人，叫老话叫三岁见老。你觉得三现在三岁这三应该有三年了吧？嗯、对。你感觉这个这个发展的趋势怎么样、嗯？其实我觉得可能有两个 level 吧，就如果是 practical level， 肯定是越来越好了，对吧？你像从三十个人，我们第二年一百个人，二百个人，现在大概四百个人，其实对很多做学校的人来讲，还是觉得 remarkable 的。嗯，这个一般很很少有，就是从，而且我们，而且我跟很多做医疗人不一样，我我没有教育经验，一般都是说，一般一般在中国的 model 是一个什么名校长，然后出来带了曾经的特级教师，对吧？一般是这么一个工作的形式，呃，所以从这角度来讲，我觉得还是挺好的。然后，另外也觉得其实也是。inspire 了很多人吧，我觉得其实当当然这并不是我的初衷，不是说我想变成 hero 哈，但是后来发现很多人会告诉我，他说因为哪怕他的孩子没有来，他也会因此有一些不同的思考啊，我觉得这个东西可能的价值会更大，嗯、呃，所以其实在这角度来讲，我觉得还是还是挺好的，就是虽然挺 difficult， 为什么有时候也觉得还是挺 rewarding 的 experience， 特别是当你看到孩子们嘛，就我觉得大人有的时候说说说的说不好听点，我们想的太多，啊、呃，每天都在想一些其实并不重要的事情，嗯、呃，但是你你要是看孩子的这个状态，你就会知道。They don't lie. Ah, 就是其实我觉得这个是，你你看他们的那些，呃，就是这个成长啊，或者什么的，就很 real 吧。所以我觉得其实，对，从这角度来讲，还是蛮 rewarding 的一个 experience。嗯。
但是我们知道，现在就是中国面临最两最大两个问题，这恰好是你的工作和你的这个事业都在发展，一个是 health care， 一个是 education。但是我们都知道，这个现在我们有一个国一个伟大的斗争是公立教育还是国际教育，对吧？而且你们你也曾经你也曾经有过类似的这个 comments 关于这个国际学校的，就是我恰好就是我的孩子就在国际学校，所以我觉得就是你怎么能说服我那个去去去伊土上学呢？我一直 philosophy 就是我不说服别人，<笑>就是我我我说我我你要自己说服自己你就可以来，你要没说服就咱们再等等。<笑>对，是这样的，就是我倒不觉得这是一个，就是说实话，就包括这种 battle alone 呃 itself， 其实是一个没有意义的 battle。就是你说公立还更好，还是什么国际更好？我说它都可以很好 ，to be honest 啊，然后它也都可以很不好啊。所以其实有的时候，所以我说我觉得咱们教育一个很大的问题，就是我们把一个非常复杂的问题给它简单化。比方说，我说路径哈，比方这是这条路，我说这条路，我说这条路，我说实际上，你说你说你，咱们就别想咱们这些人了，你就想以前所谓史史上的所谓伟人或者了不起的人，说哪一个是靠某一个成功路径培养出来的？其实是没有的。但是因为我们自己当了家长之后，我觉得其实为什么有时候你 reflect education 这个东西，其实它是。他每一茬人都是新手，对吗？你生了孩子，谁都没有说我生了孩子，并不是因为我生了孩子好，那八零后比我年轻的生了孩子就会更好。他他还跟我是一样的，所以其实他是一个不断的 relearn 的一个过程，所以不断 relearn 的过程，所以其实有的时候就他的进步就非常缓慢啊。所以你在你缓的缓慢的过程中呢，你就会发现，就是最简单粗暴的东西，大家就最容易最容易 capture 是吧？就说就是就说这个能能让你这个产生恐惧的啊，能让你产生焦虑的，然后然后给你一个虚假的安全感，就比方说你。说你，我告我告诉你啊，你走走这条路，那成功率就更高。那你说你谁不愿意自己的孩子成功率高呢？对吗？然后你就会说啊，那我就买这个东西吧。其实其实你会后来你会发现，我觉得现在咱们都这个年纪啊，成年人，你会发现这个东西很多是虚虚幻的。但是在你当时你 ，you don't know better， 是吧？所以你会做。所以有的时候我倒觉得可能就这种路径之争本身，其实它可能就是没有意义的。嗯。但是刚当时我其实对国际学校这个批评，并不是说国际学校不好。我的意思是说，我们太注重国际学校。其实我觉得国际学校这个理念或者。它整个 practice 其实肯定是带动了中国教育的进步的，这是非常客观的。但是就是现在咱们对国际教育的这种教，就是追求变成了非常表面的东西，就是我为了去学英语，或者为了我为了能出去，对吧？就是我觉得说实话，你要想出国，你看最近我们面试的学者有一个非常有意思的 candidate， 这非常难找的哈，就是这反正是非常 competitive， 他就是什么这个是山西一个小村里的，然后家里没咋，他说我我从来没有人教我英语，我就成天在网上看 friends 学会了英语，包括咱们自己想自己，我不知道你怎么学英语。我我我知道我是怎么学的英语啊！我就那时候我就我就说我到高中的时候，我当时想纠结我要去背英语。我那时候就那时候我们有那个新概念英语，我就说四册我就一篇篇全背下来。That's it。其实这些事情就是你其实有时候我们因为这些焦虑而蒙蔽了我们对一些本质问题的思考和探究，对吧？我说到底什么是让的孩子能学习？什么样的孩子能成功？是选了这条路径就能成功吗？是用了这个 APP 就能成功吗？其实都不是。但是这些人的声音很大，为什么？因为这后这些这些声音后面有钱。v e r simple as that， 大家做 marketing 都叫 share voice，share voice 很大，因为有有有有有 capital behind it， 所以大家都被这个 system 所裹挟。所以我觉得有的时候你会就是可能反而你要更清醒的去问 what exactly is the right question I should be asking 啊，我觉得这可能是一个 bigger problem。我们那我那会儿学主要是看《中国日报》和听国国际台，所以我毕业就去了国际台。对，对对然后我因为时间有限，我我再问我一个问题，就是不就是我从网上研究没发现为什么叫奴隶社会的那公号。<笑>我还真没发现为什么，能给我们现场解释解释一下吗？这个、调查记者的能力太差了。对，<笑>对当时其实就是开玩笑，因为当时我们做公众号的时候，那时候一四年吧，那时候其实也想过很多名字，说哎呀，是不是搞一个很正经的，比方说什么一诺华章的精神家园之类的。后来，哎呀，觉得好装啊。然后后来觉得还是搅一个比较有意思的嘛。然后就当时其实就是真的没有任何。后来别人问你有什么政治意义，我是完全没有，就觉得这个首先，首先大家都记住，一听就记住了，是吧？不用跟你肯定会记。记不住一诺华章的精神家园这种这种很装的名字，然后另外一个当时的想法就是说一个家庭里边比较和谐的应该是奴隶社会，就是女的说了算，男的当奴隶啊。然后呢，这个你要不愿意干，你就拉拉倒啊，然后我们再换一个啊，就基本上这个意思啊。然后这个就是，还真没看到，你看那我们那麦克他一脸的那个不太明白。<笑> Their WeChat account is called Slave Society, which she just explained why. <笑> Yeah. <laughs> Officially a slave. Okay. <laughs> 好吧，我我我们把这个时间留给我们的那个 Dory 吧。能 Let's run out Dory。我们有一些线上问题，然后大家做好准备，把这个最后的时间要
利用好。我们那个，我们还有一些上海的同事。然后我们看一下啊，呃，能否这是？我能看见没关系，你你先转着吧。Roger 王。他是说，能否分享一下美国、中国、印度各自在 K12 教育上的长短处？这个问题比较大，这个你要么试着分析一下。嗯，对，其实我觉得对这个问题，一个是比较大，另外说实话，跟大家跟我们没关系。嗯，那咱们就下一个吧。Ross l i n s o n 素质教育越来越重要，但是一线国内国外大学的录取率仍然成为衡量学校教育质量的标志。一土是如何衡量教育质量，还是学习成长过程重于可衡量的结果？嗯，就是过程重要还是成结果重要？嗯，我觉得其实当然结果重要，但是问题的定义是什么是结果？嗯，我觉得这个是要 ask the question， 就结果是你这次考试的成绩吗？还是结果你在三十岁、四十岁的时候 productive successful people， 是吧？我觉得这个其实是这样，就是我觉得教育的最大的问题是在于，其实每一个阶段它并不为下一个阶段负责。你想一想。你说幼儿园老师不会说你三十岁不成功，你跟我说当年幼儿教育你没做好，对吧？你的小学老师你高考不成功，不会说你的小学没做好。就是我的作为小学老师，我把你送到中中考，我 I'm done。OK， 所以我所有关注的就是我们眼前的那个 exit 和眼前的那个 assessment， 对大学、中学、初中、高中和大学都是一样的，所以这是教育的问题。所以有时候我们对结果，所谓的结果，其实因为它这个 system 就是这么 work 的，所以其实它，比方说你小就是什么小型出书什么什么这那的，所以我觉得这个是因此它蒙蔽了我们认为这就是结果，呃，所以我觉得这个首先要做这个问题。当然你会说我我如果不不上这辈我我也进不了啊，是吧？你可以说这个东西，所以我是觉得我首先有我不反对，我不是我不是个反体制或者反什么的人，我觉得其实。其实，而且我觉得，其实大家最好的 future 就是应该推动体制去改变。然后现在，其实而且现在整个体制也在改变，因为大家会知道，你到最后做的 at the end of the day， 实际上是一个国国力的问题嘛，是吧？你如果没有足够的这些人产生，你最后的整个国家的发展是会受影响。所以我觉得大家其实的目的是一致的，就并不是说我们一个目的是希望教育不好，一个是教育好。但是这里面核心的问题就是，所以其实我觉得我们在做两个，就第一个，我们所有的 develop 的这些 curriculum 包括 assessment， 其实是跟教育大纲啊，跟这个什么二十一。世纪教育标准啊，芬兰是一致的，所以不是我们自己编了一套啊，这是好。其实首先这个东西，这些思考，而且你哪怕大家可能都没有看过，你如果去看我们基础教育纲要，讲的都是非常对的。他讲的不是说我要什么，其实是非常对的。所以首先这些事情就是我觉得在纲要讲讲的上是一样的。然后另外一个就是也得去去，而且你要相信，就如果哪哪怕非常 practical 讲这个所谓的出口，其实这个出口也是在变的。因为我现在我跟我们清华的教授讲，你我大家可能也有，因为我知道我朋友他们那个老那个老公在北大当当教授，你说你问他们，他。他们就对每年招过来的考入北大、清华的学霸很满意吗？他也不满意，对吗？就他也希望改变，所以其实这个他们对你应该挺满意的。<笑>对，反正当年也不一定那么满意。但是我的，但是我的 point 就是说，其实其实整整个 system 都在 look for improvement 啊，所以要有这种 belief 吧。所以我说我也是，包括我们做一图也是非常 constructive。我们其实一图里面百分之八十的老师都是公立学校老师，就不是说我们找了一些其他学校了。我而且我们用的课本都是基础教育的课本，所以其实是，所以我们也是我们，而且我们是正规有证的学校，所以不是一个说我们自己搞了一套自己玩的东西。然后其实是包括这些教师培训是一样的，所以包括为什么很多体制内老师都比较也比较关注一图的创新，因为大家都在寻找这样的突破。其实我就说，我说其实你看中国的教材有问题吗？没问题。你说小学小学数学什么四百九十二个知识点，你怎么教就这些知识点，对吧？你不需要自己去 create 我怎么教数学，但是问题是用什么方法教？你说我们那时候很有意思，我们当时让孩子做学数学一年级的时候，我们就说那我们就简就有一道非常有意思的数学的叫 project， 说大家说喜喜欢吃什么？喜欢吃西红柿炒鸡蛋，我最简单。OK， 那我们就去超市看看你什么需要什么样的原料做一顿西红柿炒鸡蛋，要花多少钱？这这个其实就是个孩子能体验的数学题，而且其实没有任何成本，你不需要搞游学，你也不要报夏令营，你也不要下 APP， 对吧？你他妈就去趟市场就行了。但是问题是，所以为什么我说这个 system 很重要？因为在一般学校里面，他不让你去市场，他有安全问题，对吧？你出门之后怎么样？就所以我们很多限制其实不是 curriculum 的问题，实际上是这些问题。但是很多人不会问这些问题，大家觉得你在你为什么要出来呢？你在你在屋你在屋里边弄几个不行了，对吧？所以其实其实有的时候，所以很多时候其实就首先我觉得，首先我们做的不是一个另类的东西，其实做的是主流的东西。然后在在在主流的基础上，你需要做这这一类的这种尝试和创新。然后你要跟大家讲为什么这样让孩子学习是更好的。然后其实最终我们很有意思，你看我们最近看做在做 assessment， 我们那个三年级孩子的阅读量，我可能国家标准忘了多少了，就是我们有一个小孩叫做周百万，就是一周读一百万字，你有概念吗？你们都读不了。
叫他就是很有意思，他他就是读读小说非常有意思，三年级，所以其实孩子就是我们经常不去吹，因为我觉得有时候吹这东西吧，就变成另外一种焦虑了，说哇你们孩子学习这么好，对吧？但实际上是这样，而且不是逼出来的。孩子一旦他其实每个人，包括在座的所有的人，你们的孩子，其实每个人都是有无限的小宇宙，真的啊！就我觉得其实你说一旦把他有学合适的方法，让他有内驱力，给他有方法，其实他能能做很多很多东西。但是不是说所有的孩子都是周百万，有孩子是这样的啊，我也不想说是我们好像都很牛。但我的 point 就是实际上他完全是可以达。达到和超过现在的课程标准的，然后就是实际上这课程标准是个 bottom line， 就大家不要觉得我们这什么，其实我们的包括我们的教纲其实是个 bottom line， 但在上面这些东西其实能做很多非常有意思的创新的。嗯，来启发一下我们的小宇宙，我们现场把这个问题下一个问题给现场对，来谭敏同志。想问一个问题，是关于 education 和 social mobility 的问题，就是我想问一下，艺术教育在这方面有没有做努力？然后你是怎么看待这个两者的关系在中国是什么样的一个情况？我们这方面其实真正能做努力是非常有限的，因为我们的人很少，对吧？我们一共才四百个孩子，你你不会 adjust。我觉得这是个 system 的问题，就是从我角度来讲，我觉得我们能就从自己层面做的努力，其实就是引导孩子去关注更广阔的世界啊。因为我觉得就是现在所谓的精英教育的问题，精英教育包括所有其实最精英的学校其实是公立学校，是公立名校，真的就是我不是说咱们按钱，因为大家如果想去送孩子到一模拟公立名校，你就知道 what it means 啊。所以其实有的时候有，所以我是教育里有很多非常多的 mis。concept 好像去公立学校的就是平民，去努力斯什么学校就是，其实完全不是这样的，对吧？我我也不指名了，反正某些名校大家自己知道。如果想去，其实是是非常那个。但是但是，所以因此，我觉得这些教育的问题，就大家其实从小就把教育跟就跟社会圈层就给它 identical 了，变成。所以我说怎么能让孩子？你看我这也是我觉得做做罗德学这个这个评委很大的很感受。我就经常想，我说这些孩子怎么就成为 role scholar 的 candidate？ 对吧 ？What what makes the difference？ 就是因为你要看他们的简历啊，那都是清华北大毕业的，也是这个，就是，就是后来我就有一个 conclusion， 我觉得这个是这个这个这个这个这个这句话 worth a million dollars。我就在在 observe， 我说其实最后的 conclusion 就是这些孩子实际上是在他们小的时候 ，they've seen the real world。That's how it's different. 就他们可能他不一定自己家很穷，但是 they know what the real world is like. 这样他就会 change， 他就会 set different goals. 他会有 different purpose. 所以这种 purpose， 所以我觉得可能我们如果真的在我们孩子做，就在做这件事。我们孩子也不是有钱人的孩子，所以这也是一个 choice。就是当然你可以说是中产了，这是因为毕竟我们有学费嘛。但是在这里面，其其实我觉得这可能是为什么我们做这些东西，让他们去垃圾啊，去这些东西，其实让他们去看，就这些东西能够有这种 real world。然后另外一个就是当时刚才讲那些我们去云南的村里什么这那的。包括包括把我们那些资源给农村教师啊什么的，就我觉得，但是说实话呢 ，to be honest， 就这个东西以一个组织做的 impact 是非常有限的。但是可能为什么我们还在 keep writing， 就是我觉得其实其实可以让更多的人觉得，哎，其实这件事是可做的啊，还是愿意在外面做投入的吧。所以其实是比较 minimal 的一些 effort。嗯。哎，谢谢这边的观众，来、哎。嗯、um,。好、哦，感谢伊诺今天跟我们做这么精彩的分享啊、呃！我的问题是有关于刚才你提到的 anxiety， 然后我想提到就是家长的 anxiety， 我很感兴趣，说你是怎么想去跟家长沟通，去呃，就是帮助他们真正了解说是呃，你现在想达到教育的 goal 是什么，然后怎么让他们能变得更 open minded， 能够倾听，能够做更好的家长。对，我觉得其实，嗯。其实最后，其实所有的家长都是，其实都是一个 self education 的过程啊、呃，因为大家可能所有做家长就会知道，你你你你认为都是孩子的问题，其实都是你的问题，嗯、呃，但是很多家长意识不到，他会觉得是我的孩子不够好，啊、呃，或者怎么样的。其实我觉得越是有人 realize 到这些问题，其实对孩子就是更好的一种 improve， 就是一给他一个更好的空间吧，啊、呃，所以我觉得为什么说我们我们，所以我们对家长并不是并不一定是教他怎么做家长，而是让他怎么做好自己，啊、呃，就我这是最大的。就我们其实你看，我觉得咱们中国人吧，说实话挺惨的。就我们一直的教育里面，就是一种，说实话，我觉得就中国教育最 universal 的，中国文化里最 universal 的一个 component 就是我们有一个鄙视链。嗯，就大家为什么喜欢我？我是清华毕业的，对吧？如果我说我告诉你我是什么杭州师大毕业，当然现在人也有很牛的，就是那你就 people will think differently。如果我是中山毕业的，大家就会觉得我不一样，对吧？其实其实当然这不是不好，就我觉得每个。公司每个都是有，这是崇尚优秀嘛，这个东西没有什么不好。但是他他内在他有很多很多的 judgment， 就我们有大量的 judgment， 对吧？就是就是你会觉得，哎，就是说实话，我是我是非常 aware 的。就之所以我很很多人愿意看我，其实我我 happen to fit 了很多咱们比较主流的审美观
，对吧？你看我不是很胖，然后呢，我名校毕业，是吧？然后这个呃也还还是海归，对吧？其实这是我们主流社会里比较认可的一种 profile。I'm fully aware of it。就如果我不一样，是吧？如果我如果如果我很胖很丑，然后这个什么的，就是这些 word 在我们的文化里面是非常不容易被接纳的。因此，我们其实其实我们的做对孩子，其实我们首先我们自己成人里面有很多 self judgment。我每天都在想，哎呀，我这个地方不够好，我不敢说。所以刚才有个有我会回答那个问题，就关于中美印度的教育的问题。然后其实一会儿你做这个，你所以你其实会 project 很多你的 self judgment onto your children。然后这个 projection 你是不 aware 的，然后你认为。你认为学校应该帮你解决这些问题，其实学校是解决不了这些问题的。所以其实我其实完完全我们跟家长讲的，你我说我不是你的 service provider， 不是你买了钱我要让你我让你 happy 的，我不是你的那个，我咱俩不是这个关系，咱俩的关系是，如果你想让你的孩子好，我也想你的孩子好 ，we need to work together。Part of the problem is your problem， 对。然后 of course， 你的 s o m e t h i n g is my problem， 但是我觉得 we need to work on this together， 就这种 humility 是非常重要的。我觉得现在我们我们的教育里面缺乏这个 humility。伊诺已经主动回答到了最后一个问题了，就是这个伊土教育。网站上写着说：“这是你写的话吗？创始人的话，成全每一个人才是好教育。然后的话，就是我记得你在一段采访中还讲到，就是我希望培养出更像人的人。就是这个，就是这就是现在的教育，就不是说这个一定是要花更多的钱、上更多的课才会是更好的孩子似的。对。所以这个你不是说要回答印度那个问题吗？回答一下吗？就我觉得，特别是咱们当然谷歌的 CEO 也是也是印度同胞哈。我觉得其实我原来那文章里也写过，我其实也在反思这个东西。你看啊。其实，我觉得教育有几个层次，核心的教育就是可能一般就是它有一个所有的国家的教育，它都有一个有一个器物性的要求，这是 OK 的。然后所有人都要 literate， 对吧？就你得有基本的工作能力，有基本的这个，在这方面其实中国做的是非常了不起的。就我们在很短的时间里面把文盲率降得非常低，就大家做这个，然后再再往上一个东西就是所谓的这个培养，所谓的咱们叫做创新性人才哈，就像在座的各位，那你就算是所谓的精英吧，就是这种是能够做这这是一类。然后 eventually 你要培养 leader。啊，就培养 leader， 就 leader 是什么？ leader 其实 at the end of the day， 就是我觉得咱们讲的可能形而上一点，就大家都会知道，其实 leader at the end of the day 是能够去 face 你内心最最 deep 的 fear， 然后能够去 act differently， 然后所以我觉得中国是特别 good at 第一个 level， somehow OK 吧， at 第二个 level， extreme extremely bad at the first at the at the first level， 这是我们的 situation。所以为什么咱们在 global leader 里面很少有中国人？就我们能做到好的工程师，我。养家糊口可以，我也能做得不错啊、呃。但是我再往上走，其实我们不愿意去 face 这种 fear 啊。所以其实有时候我们认为，就是我当时在美国做了很多很久，大家经常会对印度人阿三什么这那的说得很难听，然后说你看这些人成天会搞关系，我们不会搞关系，所以人家上去了，对吧？有很多这种就是就是自欺欺人的解释。但是我觉得我我跟很多印度同事的接触下来，因为当时我在 McKinsey 在 Silicon Valley 有很多印度同事啊，我我的 honest feeling 是 I really like them 啊，我就是 I like them as people， 因为因为 they they they're very authentic。然后他们 dare to do different things。我说，如果我说我是他的手下，我也会愿意让他成为 leader。所以我就说，其实可能我认为最大的一个就在这个 level， 还是 again， 其实印度在刚才第一个 level 并不好。就是其实中国是很好的，第二个 level 也不够好，但他在这个里面，在他精英里面能成为 leader 的非常多。为什么？我觉得他 culture 里面就包括包括那个他们是佛教的这个发源地啊，是吧？你看你要你要讲这个整个佛教这个开悟，其实就是一个费心费死自己内心 fear 的一个过程。所以他们有，我觉得他们文化里面非常非常 reflective， 就是最好的 leader 一定要经常 reflect， 就你要有 reflection，reflection reflection 你才会 go deeper， 而不是说就咱就冲吧，人定胜天，对吧？就是就是、就是这种特别，就我觉得这个是特别 typical 的，就是我们中。中国文化里是实用主义的东西，就实用主义 again is not bad， 但它 not enough。就是我觉得实用主义是 basic， 你们这是我们中国人经常逻辑吧？你说你的饭都吃不饱，你还关心什么世界？所以 no no it's okay， 你可以先把饭吃饱，但是 that's not enough。所以你上面这一步，所以我觉得这个其实可能是所谓的印度教育里面，其实包括美国教育一部分。美国教育所谓的精英教育，其实它不是说咱们中国人想的说你家是哈佛的，所以你上了哈佛。当然有一些是这样的，他们也有一些 system 的这些东西。但是以 venture 里面，它整个的价值导向还是去 lead， 去 inspire 大家去。去去去 ，basically do bigger things， 然后去嗯、um, ，do bigger things by by really facing your own deepest fear。就像我做地图这件事是一样的。其实你每天很 fearful 的，对吧？你说，嗯，我每天的各种愁发愁，团队合作有问题，钱有问题，呃，政政府监管有问题。大家最可以想象，如果你里面做一个，这次我说都不是毋庸讳言，肯定有这些问题。但是你会在想，那你为什么要做这件事儿？你说你你 take a lot of conversation with yourself。啊，其实不是说 parent 是不是买你的账，是你自己。How do you convince yourself that something？ 
something you want to do. So I think this is probably eventually. I think the Indian, the, is these, these, so called high officers, become so successful. Actually, they have all these elements. Ah, so I think this is actually one of the things that we in China, these, these next level, these, if you talk about talent, is probably the most lacking. Yes, that's right. Just before we were the chairman, we changed the chairman. Then, the foreign media has a lot of reports. The most unique thing is that why is it that he is an Indian? 当然，就是听了一诺的，我觉得我们的启发就是要号召大家要向印度人学习。我觉得这是还是真是一句实话，所以我们已经比较超时了。那么最后有一个小广告，我刚看见了，就是伊土什么时候是去上海？广告告知一下吧，这那个问题已经跑了，但是我看见那个问题。对，其实暂时说实话是没有计划的，为什么呢？就是因为，就是这个，我最后于文老老于文老师问我说：“你们这个意图是什么扩张模式？”我说：“这扩张模式是等人、等钱、等地来找我的模式。”就是因为他他我们不是一个越开越挣钱的模式，他是个越开越不挣钱的模式。所以其实，所以我在讲，就是我觉得有可能会到，但是可能得得得有一个就是合适的机会吧，就是合适的机缘机由，就是可以做的。我觉得。这个，所以我们没有一个所谓的扩张计划吧，嗯，但是如果大家来不了，欢迎加入我们的线上家长社区。然后这个是。好，我们今天非常感谢伊诺给我们一个非常精彩的这个这个分享，那么也祝我们的伊土教育蒸蒸日上，好吧？然后为了表示我们的感谢，我们有一个小小礼物。啊，谢谢，嗯、谢谢。好的，好的，好，感谢感谢，谢谢，也谢谢大家，谢谢现场的观众，谢谢那个这个我们的，对对，好吧，好，谢谢，好，谢谢，散会，散会。<笑>